When we read Deuteronomy 6, 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then we look in the New Testament and we see Jesus confirming this or reconfirming this, that this is the great commandment. And in Mark 12, 29 to 30, uh, and we've touched on this before, Jesus answers the scribe who says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we see that there is not only isn't there a, a departure of the common usage and worship of the one true God, we see Jesus confirming it. He doesn't just leave it alone. He confirms it as being the active principle in Christianity. And, uh, and then in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, once again, we see Paul, who was a major propagator of the Christian faith, saying that, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So contrary to there being an express departure from the usage and terminology and the belief in one God, it is maintained and continued by express scripture declaration. Now I'm going to read a quote from Fox, and he says this, Take Judaism in its origin, text, or commentary. The patriarch with whom it commenced, Moses, the code in which it was embodied, the prophets by whom it was administered, and it is clear that a plurality of divine persons was no part of it, was excluded from it, was inconsistent with it, and could only be established on its destruction. The results of this system appear in the Jews who conceive the reception of the doctrine of the Trinity to be equivalent to denying those of Moses. End quote. And that's right. Talk to a Jew today and ask them about this doctrine of the Trinity, and they see that as a direct violation of the law of Moses. And so we can see that there, there is no sense in which that law can be changed. It was established forever. And this is exactly what we see in the New Testament in Jesus' own words, when he says things like, My Father is greater than I. Now, Jesus is establishing the supremacy of God Almighty. Now, I'm going to read another quote from Eliot, and he says this regarding the continuity of belief in one God, and that that God is the Father. He says, If it had been intended by those who spoke under the inspiration of God to convey some peculiar idea of unity, different from that which the word ordinarily conveys, as, for example, a trinity in unity instead of absolute unity, would it not have been somewhere distinctly expressed? Would the chosen people of God, Israel, whose special mission was to teach the truth concerning God's nature, have been left in ignorance of so important a doctrine as this? Would it not rather have modified all the instructions of the prophets and appeared in all their teaching? But what hint do we find of such a thing? From Genesis to Malachi, where do we find a single expression which would convey to an unprejudiced mind such an idea? End quote. And that's right. There's nothing in the Old Testament about this. And the Jews, the Israelites, were the ones under whom the word of God came, Moses. Now, why were they left in ignorance of this? You know, many Christians acknowledge and give reasons for the absence of this doctrine in the Old Testament. And one of the most common ones that I hear is that, well, the, God in his wisdom chose not to reveal it to Israel because they weren't ready for it. They couldn't handle it. Which just causes me to think, how could Moses have not handled this doctrine? Or Solomon? Why couldn't these people handle this doctrine? And this certainly militates strongly against this doctrine having been, having been taught to the Jews, and the Bible itself is a Jewish book. So certainly if this doctrine were true, if God existed in three persons, it would have been revealed to Israel. But we clearly see it was not. Now, I'm going to read a, a quote from James Gifford, and he says this about this. 
The only times in which the ancient Hebrews and their kings prospered and obtained even a series of miracles in their favor were when they adhered to only one object of divine worship. Indeed, their happiness and safety absolutely depended upon the close observance of this fundamental precept to which all the others were subordinate. It is impossible to read the Old Testament without perceiving this. In that sacred depository, it is completely evident throughout that Moses and the prophets, who acted immediately under a direct revelation and divine revelation, acknowledged but one God, but one divine person or intelligent agent, and worship no other. And then that's right. Israel's, you know, what was constantly warned against a multiplicity or a multitude of gods. And uh, Gifford goes on, he says, If there were three different persons in the Godhead, equal and eternal, it is hardly possible to conceive that two of them should have been wholly unnoticed when the object of divine worship was so professedly and openly declared by the prophets on numberless occasions and in the most solemn manner. Would the second and the third persons of the supposed trinity have been then neglected or passed over? There can be little or no doubt but that they also would have had their rights as clearly asserted and proclaimed, to the end that all enlightened people in every period, in the times of the prophets as well as now, might discriminate them in their worship, administer the honors ever justly due to each of them, and implore their respective blessings and protection." End quote. If there were two other gods, they as well would have had equal right to being represented and worshipped in the Old Testament, and they were not. They're not there. And we are left to infer from this that clearly the Trinity was not in the Old Testament. And then when we see the continuing usage of the term God in the New Testament, and we'll get into this very shortly, that it did not change, we are left to conclude quite reasonably that there is no trinity and there wasn't a trinity. Now I'm going to read something from Mary Dana who talks about the reading back into the Old Testament the trinity, okay, or that you know Jesus Christ is there and he's God and that God exists in three persons from you know from verses scattered about in the Old Testament. And she says this, in the first place, she's quoting Professor Sparks in the first place, then, he says, it will not be denied that the great design of the revelations contained in the Old Testament was to acquaint the Jews with the true nature of God. Nor will it be denied that from all these revelations they had no conceptions of any other mode of existence than that of his simple unity. It was perpetually enforced upon them as a fundamental truth that the Lord their God was one. No history, either sacred or profane, acquaints us with a single fact from which it can be inferred that the Jews had any knowledge of a threefold nature in the deity. On the contrary, all history is against such an inference, and the demonstrable certainty that these people, for whose light and improvement the Old Testament was expressly designed, never had the remotest suspicion of such a doctrine being contained in their sacred books, is the clearest possible evidence that it is not plainly taught there. Whatever may now be deduced from types and shadows and dark sayings and Hebrew idioms and double meanings. End quote. And that's right. What, what has happened is that verses are taken out of context and they're looked over and studied to, find, to try to find a way to force fit this doc doctrine or concept of the Trinity back into the Old Te Testament texts. And any Jew will tell you that, any knowledgeable Jew will tell you, that there is only one God, the Father, represented in the Old Testament. You know, I can't help but wonder here what would happen after the return of Christ and after all things are made new and new Jerusalem descends out of heaven and, and the kingdom is, is handed up to God, I, I can't help wondering what it would be like for a Jew, say perhaps Solomon or Moses, when talking with a Christian about his conception of God while they lived their lives here on earth, wouldn't it seem strange to Solomon or Moses that there were three gods and that God didn't establish this truth from the beginning to Israel, 
you know, the, the chosen people of God? I would think that Moses or Solomon would feel left out. You know, you, what do you mean, God, there's, there, there's three of you in, in one? Why didn't you tell us? We only thought there was one. You know, that's just an anecdote, and I thought I'd throw that in there. Now, what I want to look at is that there was no express change or explanation of a change in the concept of God between the Old and the New Testaments. And I'm going to uh, start with a quote from Eliot. And he says this, I do not know of any other arguments now used to prove that a plurality of persons in the Godhead is hinted at in the Old Testament. One thing very important is certain that if any such hints were conveyed, the Jews never understood them. The presumption is that they knew their own language, and it is certain that they understood that the unity of God was taught by their scriptures in the most absolute and unqualified manner. Such was their interpretation of Moses and the prophets at the time when Christ came. In all Palestine, there probably could not have been found a single man or woman who supposed that there was any distinction of persons such as now taught in the unity of God. If, therefore, such a doctrine is contained in the New Testament, it must have been completely a new revelation to the Jews, and not only new, but also strange. At first sight, it must have appeared to them then, as it does now, subversive of their ancient doctrine. It would have been necessary, therefore, for the Savior and his apostles to state it very plainly and to prove its consistency with the law of Moses. If we find no such statement, we may conclude that there was no such doctrine. Silence under such circumstances would be a full consent to the old Jewish belief in the unity of God. End quote. And that's right. There would have to be a plain statement that the concept was changed. There's not a Jew in the Old Testament, and not even today, continuing in the Jewish tradition and, and laws, that the, there's more than one God. And if we find no statement, he says, silence on this issue is an affirmation that the, the concept of the unity of God is maintained and perpetuated through the New Testament. And then Eliot continues, he says this, What shall we say then, when we find that this doctrine is reaffirmed, the unity of God, is reaffirmed over and over again by Christ and his apostles in the strongest possible language? which is used without any explanation or any hint that a peculiar sense is to be attached to the word one when applied to God. No less than 1,326 times is the word God used in the books of the New Testament without any explanation to guard us from what our Trinitarian friends would call a fatal error upon this which is the fundamental doctrine of religion. End quote. And that's right. The term God is used, as he says, over 1,900 times in the New Testament, and not once is there an explanation attached to it, that the concept of God has changed. And even some say that this is a fatal error not to believe in the Trinity, or not to believe that Jesus is God, and, and yet there's no nothing, no warning, no anything against misconstruing that God is a different person than what he revealed himself to be to Israel. Now, let's take a look at a couple of verses in the New Testament to see if there might even be a, a hint that the concept of God was changed. So, take your Bible, if you have it, and go to John 8, verses 41 to 42. And this is what is said. I'll start in verse 40. But now you see, this is Jesus speaking. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. And and that's this is very clear when we read that the people Jesus was talking to said, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. And then Jesus continued this usage. He said, Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me, because I came forth and proceeded from him. So we see the whole context establishing 
and maintaining the concept of one God, the Father, here. And over in verse 54 of the same chapter, Jesus continues, he says, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. So Jesus is, is establishing that his God is, his God and Father is the same God of the Old Testament. Because the people Jesus was talking to at this point were Jews and they didn't accept Christ's person. They didn't accept him as the Messiah. So they certainly had no concept of a trinity. And so what's taking place here is that Jesus is just continuing the usage of the idea that God is the one God and the one Father to be worshipped. He didn't correct them when they talked about it. He simply maintained that usage. And then I want to take a look at Acts 3, 13. And let's see what is said here. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now take a look at this verse again and, and paying attention to the usage of the word God. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. And that's very clear because there's a reference made to the God of the Old Testament. And that is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He's glorified Jesus. And this is the language that we constantly meet with and read in the New Testament. So it's just a continuation of the Old Testament concept of God and that that God is one and that he is supreme. Now, now let's look at the fact that the Jews didn't question the notion that God came in the flesh. Okay, surely they would have had questions on this subject. I alluded to it earlier in the seminar that the Jews, you know, they questioned Jesus on what on taxes. Yeah, you don't wash your hands. You sit with sinners. You know, all, all these things that Jesus, you know, he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. All the picayune parts of the law, they questioned Jesus on and, and even in, tried entrapping him in some of these. And yet, on this new concept that there's three gods, you know, if this were actually true, where God were changing the idea and now introducing into Christianity that he really exists in three, the Jews never questioned him on this, and they certainly would have. In fact, they probably would have stoned him for this. And I'm going to read a quote from Hindman on this. He says, on page 54, Christianity, it must be remembered, was planted and grew up amidst sharp-sighted enemies who overlooked no objectionable part of the system and who must have fastened with great earnestness on a doctrine involving such apparent contradictions as the Trinity. We cannot conceive an opinion against which the Jews, who prided themselves on the adherence to God's unity, would have raised an equal clamor. Now, how happens it that in the apostolic writings, which relate so much to objections against Christianity and to the controversies which grew out of this religion, not one word is said implying that objections were brought against the gospel from the doctrine of the Trinity. Not one word is uttered in its defense and explanation, not a word to rescue it from reproach and mistake. This argument has almost the force of demonstration. We are pers persuaded that had three divine persons been announced by the first preachers of Christianity, all equal and all infinite, one of whom was the very Jesus who had lately died on a cross, this peculiarity of Christianity would have almost absorbed every other, and the great labor of the apostles would have been to repel the continual assaults which it would have awakened. But the fact is that not a whisper of objection to Christianity on that account reaches our ears from the apostolic age. In the epistles, we see not a trace of controversy called forth by the Trinity. End quote. And that's absolutely right. This is such a powerful argument that you don't see the Jews challenging Jesus on it. It was that simple. The Jews were, were questioning everything about this guy who was going around healing people. And then once Jesus started to get a following, they tried to entrap him. And what? They don't even bring it up. They, Jesus said he was the son of God, and they got upset at that. And they challenged him on that even. 
So you can imagine how the New Testament would be written if Jesus had introduced this concept as it is alleged or supposed that he had brought in this new concept of being God. And bear in mind that it wasn't only the apostles' job to introduce Christianity into the world and state dispassionately its doctrines, but they had to defend it from the doubters and, and the objections that were raised against it. Not only the apostles, but Jesus had to do this too. He defended it in different ways, but there was a defense made. And certainly, if there were a defense made on the Picayune issues, the Jews certainly would have raised one, and this would have been the foremost objection that they would have had, that new gods are being introduced into, into the scheme or the concept of, of God. And it's very interesting that Jesus, in John 4.22, when he was speaking with the woman of Samaria, says this, Ye worship, ye know not what, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now keep that in mind, because the whole Old Testament was to the Jews and by the Jews for their enlightenment. They were the chosen people. And Jesus spoke, uh, I believe this was the only non-Christian woman that Jesus spoke to or ministered to. Uh, not, not Non-Jewish woman, this woman of Samaria. I believe this was the only recorded, the only record in Scripture relating to Jesus and him witnessing. He went unto the Jews, and he knew what their conception of God was, and yet they never questioned him on it. <laughs> and they certainly would have. So... I'm going to read a brief quote from Andrews Norton, and he puts it very simply this way. He says, The doctrine of the Trinity is proved to be false because it is evident from the Scriptures that none of those effects were produced which would necessarily have resulted from its first enunciation by Christ and its subsequent communication by his apostles. End quote. Read the New Testament and see if Jesus had truly introduced and the apostles had truly taught that there's a new concept of God and that the old usage of the word God was being discontinued and there's a new usage, read the Bible, use your common sense in the New Testament and see if it would be written the way it's written. There would have been record upon record upon record of Jews questioning this doctrine that's so hard to understand. Its mysteriousness could have been clarified in a couple of chapters, I'm sure, in the Bible, if this were intended to be taught. But it's obviously not. You know, Norton goes on, and I won't read it, but he says, he makes the point, take your own self, take yourself back to the time of the apostles, put yourself as a person walking around with the Messiah, you know, may, we're made out of clay. Take yourself back to the time, walking around with the Messiah, and then at some point you learn he's God Almighty. And then put yourself in a position where you're going to write one of the epistles or one of the gospels. Would you write it the way, would it be written? Would you have written it the way it's written? Or would you not, g g gosh, at every chance you got, would express that Jesus is God and, and, and God, God, you know, what, you would just go on and on and on. But when we look in John twenty thirty one, what do we see? John says, all these were written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's not what he would have written. It wouldn't have been written that way. There would have been so much of this glorious exaltation of Jesus, uh, and, and just it would have just poured out of these at every chance they had. But as evidenced by the fact that they didn't do it, we can take that, and it's very reasonable to state it was never taught by them. And in the same light, I'm going to read a quote from Hindman, and, it's re and he's referring to Jesus' usage of the word God or Father in prayer. He says this, When the disciples of our Lord, perceiving that he was in the daily habit of praying to the Father and to no other person or being, when this was the practice to which they themselves were always accustomed, when they expressly asked him if this practice were right, and he assured them it was, by directing them to continue the use of the common language, could they possibly believe that they were to worship two other persons besides the one invocated in the form prescribed? Could they conceive that Jesus Christ himself was one of those other persons? 
He whose most humble and devout addresses to the Father they so often witnessed, could they imagine that this very being was the Father or an essential part of the Father? End quote. And that's right. Again, the Bible would have been written entirely differently if this doctrine were true. Jesus, as an example, prayed to the Father, taught them to pray to the Father. They were not in the habit of praying to the Father. My understanding of Judaism was that the Holy of Holies or the rabbis did that for the people, but they themselves didn't do it. Now they're being taught to pray. We take it for granted in Christianity because from the time we were brought in, we were taught that we could communicate with God Almighty. There are many Jews today who don't even say the name God or the word God because they think it's disrespectful. And similarly, you know, looking at that, the the disciples asked Jesus, they were, you know, Jesus was praying to God. They modeled themselves after him. They asked him if this was the way that this was to be done, and he assured them it was. Could they have assumed that he meant pray to the three-part being, and I'm one of those parts? My divine nature's up there? Clearly not. That's ludicrous to think that they did. They were Jews, and they were simply praying to God the Father, the very same being that Jesus Christ prayed to. Now, a verse that I'll bring to your attention on this is Romans 329 referring to the common usage of the word or title God and how it is the same in the Old Testament when it was revealed to Israel and now in the New Testament when it is available for anybody to be grafted in or to become a Christian or to have God as his father it says this very simply is he the God of the Jews only is he not also of the Gentiles yea of the Gentiles also now we're talking about the same God, the same God that was established in the Old Testament to be the Father, the one only true God. The language and the continuity of that word and all that is embodied in that word God is continued right into the New Testament where even the Gentiles now understand it and uh, can use that, so to speak. Now I'm going to read a quote about the argument that the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't revealed until after Pentecost. See, there have been a number of reasons given as to why the doctrine of the Trinity is not in Scripture or not clearly revealed in Scripture. Some say it's in the Bible, it's not in the Old Testament, but it's in the New. Others say uh, it, it isn't revealed until after Pentecost, and some say even it's not in the Bible at all. Uh, it wasn't revealed until the Nicene Creed in 325 AD, but I'm going to look at the argument now that this doctrine of the Trinity wasn't revealed until after Pentecost. And what we're going to look at is the Apostles' continuation of common usage, the common usage of the word or title God, and that, that their belief continued in that one God, and that there was no departure from that established truth. And I'm going to quote in Eliot, and he says, now he's quoting Deuteronomy 6.4, To us there is but one God, even the Father. The Savior's testimony is therefore the same with that of Moses, and is referring to Mark 12.29 and 30. But although this is admitted by many Trinitarians, it is said that the revelation of the new doctrine was reserved until after the descent of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. Let us look then at the preaching of the apostles at that time and subsequently. We find it to be exactly the same. The same language is used concerning God without any hint that it is to be taken in a peculiar sense. These are their words. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom God hath raised from the dead. And he goes, and again, this Jesus hath God raised up. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. This language is repeated in the first six or seven chapters of the book of Acts over and over again, and God is always spoken of without any qualifying word as the only supreme being by whom Christ was sent, raised up, and glorified. Does this look like the revelation of a new doctrine concerning God? End quote. And that's right. Look and see. If the Trinity is true, if the double nature is true, does it seem like the Bible is written to produce that effect in us, that we would understand that? 
No, there, there's no new doctrine concerning God. It is simply continued. Now, after looking at this in this light, uh, I just wonder what words could be used to establish God's supremacy any more than what we've read and what we've seen. You know, Jesus Christ says, my father is greater than I. And then it is said, well, he didn't really mean that. Uh, it just there's so many arguments that are designed to tear down the supremacy of God. And it just I just one has to ask oneself, you know, how on earth could it have been established that God is supreme? You know, any words that are put forth by the Messiah that indicate that he and state ex explicitly that he's inferior to God and God is superior to him are denied. And I just wonder, are there any words? And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read a quote fairly slowly from James Gifford to close out this section. And what he does is he puts together some verses from the Old Testament and lays them right next to verses in the New Testament and, and just wants to demonstrate by force that God is supreme. And he, and he says this, It is therefore exceedingly wonderful how such opinions should ever have maintained any hold in the minds of serious and intelligent men. If we collect again, and it cannot be done too often on this occasion, a few of the plain and emphatical expressions of the Old Testament, and likewise some of the New, their united force may, possibly, demonstrate the difficulty and danger that we throw ourselves into when we depart in any manner from our obedience to such solemn injunctions, in which it is evident no more than one divine person is intended. And here he goes with verses that he just lays side by side. I am the Lord your God, there is none like me. Thou shalt worship no other God. The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He is thy praise and he is thy God. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him thou shalt serve and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He that sacrificeth unto any God save unto the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Again, I forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him who, after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. For my father is greater than I, my father is greater than all. Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is, God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father who is in secret, and thy Father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And those are the end of his quotes, the verses that he cites, to show that the usage is the same and it is continued. And I'll just read his closing statement there. He says, this is Gifford, Here is a minute assemblage of the declarations and precepts of God, of Moses, and of Christ. They are in exact harmony and as perfectly clear as harmonious. And that's simple. Look at the usages of the word usage of the word God in the Old Testament. Look at it in the Gospels. Look at it in the New. And we see time and time again that God is supreme. And God is our Father, that He is supreme. Deuteronomy 6.4 is restated in Mark 12.20. 8, 29, 30, by our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, nothing could be clearer than that, there, that this continuity of belief in one God and that he has no equals is maintained and emphasized and re-emphasized in the New Testament. And what we're going to look at now is God and his nature and commandments that he has given about the worship of him. And I'm going to start in Deuteronomy 13 and I'm going to read the first five verses and this is an establishment that God makes so clear 
that nobody is to distract the worship and affection that is to be given to God in the supreme sense. And he makes this perfectly clear, and I'll read this. Verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. And in particular, back in verse 2, it says, And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Well, what we've seen is that this doctrine of the Trinity indeed does teach other gods, and let's go after other gods. And this may appear very strong, and I'm not speaking to the intentions of the Trinitarian of today, or a Trinitarian of any time frame, whether he or she intended to do this. It would be my sentiment to say no. They didn't mean to do it. But nonetheless, God has guarded the worship due to him very carefully and in the most emphatic language, even saying that if there is a prophet that rise up among you and says, let us go after other gods, that one should be put to death. Now, that's not observed now, and uh, I won't comment on that, but clearly what we're to get from this is that God wants undivided worship. And the importance of worship in the supreme sense to God our Heavenly Father is absolutely established. And Jesus affirmed this in his own testimony about God. I'm going to read a quote from Eliot, and he's just going to go verse after verse after verse showing that Jesus Christ denied to be that one true God. And we can even see this just as, we, as you read the Bible on your own, you can see how Jesus spoke about God. He always spoke about God in the third person, which means that he referred to God as another being other than himself. He never said, I am God. He always referred to God and spoke about him, and, and thereby establishing that Jesus Christ is not God in his own language. But we're going to see explicit doctrinal verses that establish the foundational principle and reestablish it and reconfirm the law of the Old Testament that we're not to worship other gods on the same level that we worship God. We can worship Jesus Christ, which simply means to, means to pay homage to him, but not in the same way we give homage to God Almighty. God forbids that. Okay, he says, uh, Eliot says, let us look at the teaching of Christ himself first, and then of his apostles. Christ uniformly spoke of God as his Father, and of the Father as the only true God. Almost his first recorded words are these, quote, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. End quote. He prayed to God as his Father, and taught his disciples to pray in the same words, quote, Our Father who art in heaven. End quote. Upon one occasion, when someone called him good master, he answered, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. Upon another occasion, when asked what was the first commandment of all, he commenced in the very words of the law spoken from Mount Sinai, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. Observe how solemn is this affirmation of the old doctrine. It is a reenactment of the great central law of the Jewish religion without one word of amendment or qualification. Can we ask anything more? But we have more 
if possible. If this were all, it might perhaps be argued that the word God includes the idea of tri-personality in the Father, Son, and Spirit. But the Savior has forbidden such a construction by teaching us that the God of whom he spoke is the Father only. We once more refer to the words of our text, words of prayer to the Father. Quote, this is life eternal, that they may know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. End quote. He speaks of himself, the Son, as a separate being dependent on the Father. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Again, in his prediction of his heavenly exaltation, he says, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. So when in the Garden of Gethsemane he prayed to the Father, Not my will, but thine be done. And on the cross, in the time of his last agony, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet once more, after his resurrection, he said to his disciples, I ascend unto my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Thus, through his whole ministry, he used the same uniform and familiar language. I ask you again to remember that this language was addressed to those who had no conception of any other doctrine than the absolute unity of God. How must they have understood it? I think, just as we understand it now, when we say, To us there is but one God, even the Father. End quote. And so what we look at when we see these verses that are so clear and explicit in establishing who the one true God is and what he is about, and that the Messiah is indeed the Son of God, but subordinate to God, we, we need to ask ourselves, have the Trinitarian arguments that have been put forth sufficiently accounted for an overthrow of the clear doctrine or an establishment of a new doctrine based in Scripture? And the answer is no. They haven't come close to overthrowing these clear verses. Now, in our contemplation of God and who he is, we've been given a guide in Jesus Christ, not only to lead us to God, but to also give us an understanding of God. And it is argued that because Jesus is the express image of his person or being in the form of God, that Jesus is therefore God. But what's to be understood from that expression is that Jesus was so similar to God's goodness that he only did God's will here on earth. And we read verses to that effect. And a point must be made that being the express image of his person or being in the form of God does not make Jesus Christ God. Clearly it makes him separate from him. We read in Romans 8.29 regarding us. It says, For whom he, God, did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. We're obviously not Jesus Christ. We read in 1 Corinthians 11.7. It says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God but the woman is the glory of the man. So again, we read that a man is the image and glory of God. The same thing is predicated of us as it is Jesus Christ. And it must always be borne in mind that so many of the expressions used to describe Jesus Christ in his relationship with God are also predicated of us, the members of the church as being either the image of Christ or the image of God. Now, one of the arguments that's essential to this doctrine of the Trinity is that God is omniscient, and there are things in Scripture that appear to make Jesus Christ omniscient, and therefore making Jesus Christ omniscient and therefore God. And what we see in Scripture very clearly is that Jesus always recognized God, his Father, as the omniscient one, all-powerful one, the God over all. We clearly see Jesus referring all things to God who is supreme. And uh, we read in Matthew 11:27 that all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, 
and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And it's evident that God is supreme and above Jesus Christ in, in order. We read in John 5.20, The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things. So Jesus is shown all things by this same Father, our God. In, uh, in 8.26 of John, I speak those things that I have heard of him. Okay, agreeing completely with what we just read. In uh, 5.28, Then shall ye know that, as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. So, Jesus' Father taught him. So clearly, Jesus isn't being recognized here as om omniscient. Only God, if anyone's omniscient, only God is recognized in that capacity. In 5.38, I speak that which I have seen with my Father. In F John 15.15, 15, All things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now what we get from that verse is very clear. Jesus Christ is indeed our guide to the Father. Whatever Jesus learned from God or was taught by God, Jesus turned around and taught us. And thank God for that. He not only was our Redeemer, but he's our teacher. Teaching us things about God, about Satan, about mankind, and, and what goes on in the world. We read in Revelation 1.1. It starts right off the bat in the Revelation uh, given. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. And so it's so abundantly clear that we see a continuation of the supremacy of God. And no matter how subtle the arguments of the Trinity may be, there's no way that, you know, in their subtlety, and, and that is, keep in mind, that is exactly how error works. That is the exact tool that Satan has used. We read back in Genesis that the serpent was more subtle and wise than any beast of the field, but he's more subtle. And subtleties are the way in which people get thrown off course. Sure, if something were so blatantly obvious, it wouldn't affect anybody. But step by step, bit by bit, people get suckered into going off course. And that is in perfect alignment with entropy, which we looked at earlier. Something will force you, something has indeed forced the church off of course. And now it's going to take a great deal of effort to get the church back on course, especially in relationship with the one true supreme God, and tearing down this doctrine that there are three co-equals that we're to worship equally. Gosh, God gave these revelations unto Jesus Christ, and then Jesus Christ turned around and gave them to the church. Even the day of Jesus Christ's return, we read uh, in Mark 13, 32, of that day and hour... No, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And in Matthew 24, 36, it even reads better. It says, but my Father only. Therefore, clearly making a separation between God and his you know, being all-knowing and Jesus Christ not being all-knowing. It's established here clearly that God is the only omniscient supreme being. And the clincher of clinchers regarding Jesus' derived power, whatever power Jesus had, came from God. We read in Matthew 28, 18, and it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And that power, as we have read, came from God Almighty. The omniscient, all-powerful, almighty God gave this power unto Jesus. So the, it's established, the context and the truth is established that we do have one God and Jesus spoke continually about that one God and that he himself is not or was not that one God. And now regarding the authority of God and Jesus recognizing and speaking that God Almighty is the supreme authority figure. We just read Matthew 28, 18. We see in Luke 22, 29. I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. <laughs> so we are appointed a kingdom by our Lord because, or in the same way, that God appointed one unto Jesus. In John 5, 22, we read, The Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. 
So all judgment has been committed unto him, not because he's God, it's been given. We read in John 7, 16, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, these verses just pile up. Uh, in, in John uh, 8, 42, I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Gosh, in John 7, 49 and 50, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. In John 14, 24, the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Yeah, it's on and on. Uh, Revelation 2, 26 and 27, to him will I give power even as I received of my Father. So clearly Jesus received his power from God. God is omniscient and the supreme authority figure. Clearly established, starting back with Israel, the fundamental tenet of their religion continued to this day and it's been reconfirmed in the New Testament. And we see it clearly here in the words of our Messiah, whom is the one that we ought to trust the most. His words we should trust the most of any men. We should trust his words, and his words are abundantly clear that he got the power and authority and the teachings and the doctrine from God Almighty. Gosh, we read in John 5.19, and keep in mind that John has been the, the most frequently cited gospel writer, uh, perhaps even the most frequently cited book of the Bible, as teaching this doctrine of the double nature of Christ and the Trinity. And we're reading most of these verses from the Gospel of John, what John said, bearing in mind that in John 20, 31, he said, All these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. A clear verse. Then we look back in the text and we see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, however many you want to count, clear verses that establish God's supremacy over the Messiah. We read in John 5:19, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So it's established once again by the Messiah himself in the Gospel of John that Jesus can do nothing. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Now keep in mind the verse that says, The things of God are clearly known by that which he has created. So, what we do is we see in the natural realm, we see a son, one years old, two years old, three years old, learning from his father and mother how to conduct him, himself. And, and likewise, we see the same thing manifested with Jesus and God Almighty. Jesus learned from his father. It's just that simple. No complicated windings that are needed to explain that. It's just biblical and it's straightforward. We read in John 5.30, I can of my own self do nothing. Now, that sure doesn't sound like God Almighty. I can of my own self do nothing. Now, as a result of God's goodness unto mankind, sending the Messiah and the Messiah leading people to God, it is frequently said that Jesus was glorified by the people. And it is taken that because he's glorified, he's therefore God. And so we read in Galatians 1, 24, And they glorified God in me. And so people have taken this to mean, and this is the King James, that while well, Jesus was going around doing this, God was, we read in elsewhere, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And the argument is therefore made, the inference is drawn, that Jesus must be God. But regarding the phrase glorifying God, Okay, Jesus went about doing things, and God received the glory because he had given such power unto men. Now, in the NIV translation of that very same verse, Galatians 1.24, they have it right. And they say regarding glorifying God, it says, And they praised God because of me. And that's better put. See, the, the King James Version can be difficult to understand. It is in many cases. But they praised God because of me. And sure, I mean, you can even see it when a friend does something nice for you or really does something nice for you. You would praise God or thank God because of that person. 
but it's because that person manifested goodness, and that goodness which they manifested is a reflection of God's light and love. And therefore, God would ultimately get the glory and the supreme glory. And that's what it is for God to be glorified in Christ or because of Christ. He receives glory because of us as well. Now, I'm going to read just some more verses about God and about how that God could not become or be a man. And the uh, converse is true. A man cannot be or become God. We read in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. It is established clearly here that God is not a man. And the context continues, but it's established God is not a man that he should lie or really do anything as a man. In Hosea 11:9, I am God and not man. God is clearly establishing that he's simply God and not man. And this is an immutable truth. God doesn't lie and God doesn't change. But it is argued, well, Jesus is going to be the judge on that great and final day. Clearly, he must have known everything everybody ever did, and that makes him all-knowing, and that makes him omniscient. They're all powerful. And it's a very simple response to that when we look at who the originator of the plan is and who's going to carry that plan out of judgment. I'm going to read a quote, and this is referring to Acts 17.31. And Acts 17.31 says this, Because he hath appointed a day, God hath appointed a day, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man. The King James has that in quotes, but the Greek should read, By a man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all in that he hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead. That's how he gives assurance that he's raised Jesus from the dead, that he's appointed Jesus the judge. He's appointed him. He's ordained him to be a judge. Not because Jesus is God. I'm going to read a quote on this by Norton. And just Norton says this, Again, it is inferred that Christ is God because it is said that he will judge the world. To do this, it is maintained, requires omniscience, and omniscience is the attribute of divinity alone. I answer that whatever we may think of the judgment of the world spoken of in the New Testament, St. Paul declares that God will judge the world by a man, not a God, whom he has appointed. And that's simple. We look at Jesus Christ representing God, representing God as almighty, as God's agent to teach us that which God taught him. We've been led to God and taught of God by or through Jesus Christ. This is how the blessings of God have been manifested unto mankind through the Messiah, the Christ. So what we see here is such a clear establishment of God's supremacy and that the Messiah came to lead us to that God. God has been reaching out to mankind ever since he created us, ever since he created Adam and Eve. And even after Adam and Eve rebelled, he still had this plan of man's redemption so that we could live eternally once again. But now we have to fight for that right. Not everybody qualifies. In fact, the Bible says few will. But nonetheless, God has been reaching out to mankind. He did it in the Old Testament through the prophets, and he did it in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. And even there are prophets in the New Testament as well, but primarily through Jesus Christ. Now, God is referred to in the Scripture as the Holy Spirit. Okay, This is a fundamental position of Unitarianism, that the Holy Spirit is not a separate God, to be worshipped, but is simply another title or name or even an attribute of God himself. God is holy and God is spirit. We find that in the Bible throughout it. And so those two words are conjoined and he's referred to as the Holy Spirit. Now how do we know this? Well, let's first look at Acts 28:25. Verse 25, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. Okay, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. 
Then we're going to jump over to Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to see that the name God and Holy Spirit are used interchangeably. Not representing two separate persons again, but representing the same person. We saw in Acts 25, well spake the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet. All right. Then we see in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Isaiah being one of them, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the ages. So it's established here that in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets and in Acts 28 25 well spake the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers so it's established and it's in other places but that's simple you can look it up yourself it's clear that simply the term Holy Spirit as opposed to unholy or unrighteous and spirit as opposed to man, we simply see that our attention is being drawn to God being holy and spirit, and yet he was able to speak unto mankind through the prophets. And now in these last days, when the Messiah was here, and even now, Jesus Christ being seated on the right hand of God, he's the head of the church. He's interacting with the church. So God is still speaking unto mankind through the Messiah, and we see that in Revelation throughout Revelation, and especially in the beginning, that Jesus is representing God and speaking to the church from God. And even, you know, a stronger case is that when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, I mean, that was deep. <laughs> that was the Messiah right there talking to Paul himself. And so it's obvious that Jesus has interacted and continues to interact with the church. And you must decide what balance you're going to strike. But clearly God is represented as supreme overall. Now I suppose I'll give you one more example of how the term Holy Spirit is used as a reference to God himself and not as a separate God. And just Acts 5, 3 and 4. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So in, you know, in the same context we see in verse 3, it says that Ananias lied, you know, Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 4, you have not lied unto men, but unto God. So we see that the terms God and Holy Spirit are used interchangeably. So having looked at a lot of verses pertaining to God and his omnipotence what we'll do now is we'll look at Jesus Christ the Messiah and we'll look at his purpose for coming and his very his being you know what makes Jesus Jesus and what Jesus's relationship is was and is with God all right now as we get into the discussion about Jesus Christ and who he is and his relationship with God, it's important that we establish something here. And we're going to go to John 4, verse 24, and we're going to see something about God and his composite makeup, if you will, what we are told in Scripture. And it says, God is a, a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the essential aspect of this is God is a spirit, or God is spirit. And hence, he is also called Holy Spirit, as opposed to Unholy Spirit, which Satan and a third of the angels that were kicked out of heaven are unholy spirits. God is spirit. Now, what is interesting about spirit, and we'll hear it in the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, when he says in Luke 24, 39, and this is after he had been resurrected from the dead, and he says this, he's talking to the apostles, he says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And so what we see here clearly is that God is spirit, and Jesus is affirming this, that a spirit hath not flesh and bones. 
But Jesus said, as you see me have, me, a man, I've got flesh and bones. Now, an important element of this verse is the fact that it was after Jesus' resurrection, which if he were to resume some special nature, as is supposed, it, it would have happened after he was raised from the dead. But actually what happened is he was simply restored to his condition before he was crucified and put in the tomb for three days. And this was his victory, and in fact our victory, over death. God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and Jesus was restored back to his form prior to his death. And that, in fact, is our victory. It says in Scripture that we will receive new bodies, and they'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body, uh, free from sin. So we see here that God is spirit, and Jesus is not spirit. So there goes that double nature of Christ thing, that he's fully God and fully man. He's represented in Scripture as only being a man. So he couldn't, he simply couldn't be God. And also, we've read many verses, and there are many more in Scripture, where Jesus is repeatedly said to have a God, just as we are said to have a God. But it, it's interesting that nowhere in scriptures is it stated that God the Father has a God. So it's clear from this that God our Father has no God. And it is also clear that Jesus Christ has a God. And Jesus Christ God is the same God that we have. And that God is spirit. That is his very nature. And all else that which he has created, at least here on earth, is flesh and bones you know, mankind, and that includes Jesus Christ. Now we see in John 14, verse 1, we see once again Jesus' own words, and he says this, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Right there, a clear separation between God and me. You believe in God, that's, you know, he's saying that's established and that's a good thing, but believe also in me. And I think it goes deeper than just believe that I'm here. I think it means believe that I'm the Messiah. Believe that I am he who has come to lead you to God, to an understanding of God, to a relationship with God, to a reconciliation with God. Hence, Jesus is called the mediator. Now, before Jesus' crucifixion, as he carried on his ministry and uh, lived for approximately 31 years, he, it's not denied that he's a man. It's perfectly clear in Scripture that he was a man, and no Trinitarian denies that he was a man. And in fact, the double nature of Christ says he was fully God and fully man. So it's not denied that he was a man. But how about after his crucifixion and before his ascension? Do we see him represented in any, in any other way other than as a man? So let's look at Matthew 17, verse 8. And that says, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And it's clear there, when they lifted up, you know, this is after his crucifixion, and he had come out of the tomb, and God had raised him from the dead already. And uh, when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus, here clearly referred to as a man. Now, how about after Jesus' ascension? After he was taken up into the cloud by God, God just took him up there. Well, we read in 1 Timothy 2, 5 about that time period, which is still ongoing, when Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God. How is Jesus spoken of in Scripture? And it's very simple. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So it's very simple where Jesus Christ is represented as a man. He was prophesied to be a man in the Old Testament of uh, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, and so on. Then he's born, obviously a man, after his crucifixion. And he's walking around here on earth and appeared to the twelve and to hundreds of others. He's represented as a man. We see that. And then, after he is glorified by God, taken up into heaven, he is still a man. So what we see here is that Jesus is spoken of as a man all along, 
Old Testament prophecies regarding him, the Gospels, and, and even now taken up into heaven. And we also see God spoken of throughout the entire Bible as God Almighty. So this doctrine of the Trinity does not adequately account for what we see in Scripture. It does not overthrow our clear conception of who God is and who Jesus Christ is. And that God, our Heavenly Father, is Jesus Christ, a man, his Heavenly Father, his God as well. And now I'm going to quote from Eliot, and he first cites Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16, which say this, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Eliot goes on to comment on this. He says, These words distinctly explain the subject before us this evening. The question asked is exactly that which we now ask. Whom do the scriptures say that Jesus Christ is? And the answer given is exactly the same which we, as Unitarian believers, would give. We take the words in their fullest meaning and adopt them as the confession of our faith. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In these words, not only the statement of our belief is contained, but also the argument on which it rests. The word Christ means anointed. It is in Greek, the same with Messiah in Hebrew, and implies that Jesus was anointed by God with Holy Spirit and with power to become a prince and a savior, a prophet and a judge. It implies, therefore, very high distinction, but at the same time a distinction conferred by one higher than himself. End quote. And that's plain and obvious. Jesus Christ, the word Christ, means anointed. Now, it's just ludicrous to think that God could be anointed. To be anointed implies directly that there is one above you doing the anointing. And that's exactly what we get from this text. And we see in John 5, 20 and 21, it says, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And uh, John Milton, in his treatise on Christian doctrine, says this about those verses. Even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And then he goes over to verse 36, which says, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Then Milton says, It is not therefore his deity of which they bear witness, but his mission from God. And that's exactly right when we see things. The works Jesus did bear witness that God was with him and that Jesus was sent by God to complete this mission. And clearly Jesus' mission was divine or of God. That's another way of putting divine of God or originating with God or representing God. Absolutely it was divine. And hopefully your mission in life, whatever that may be, is divine or reflects honor and glory upon God and represents God and our Lord Jesus Christ in the best way. Sure, we want that. And that's exactly what Jesus did to the highest extent that anybody has ever done it. He didn't sin. Now, in John 15:15, 15, 15, I'll start in verse 14. Here, Jesus is saying, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So, there's a statement of the divinity of Jesus' mission, the purpose of his mission, is that what he learned from God, he then turned around and taught to the apostles, who then turned around and taught the rest of mankind, and it filtered down. It is filtered down to us unto this very day, thanks to the records we have in the Scripture. Now, what else was? What was Jesus sent for? Okay, we want to take a look at. Okay, we hear he was sent into the world. What was he sent for? Was he sent to show himself to be God, and that we would believe that he is God? Well, let's look at Luke 4:43. It says there, And he said unto them, 
I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And that's a very simple statement there. He came to preach the kingdom of God. He didn't come to preach that he was God. He came to teach people about God and entrance into the kingdom of God. And that he, Jesus, was the way, the truth, and the life because no man comes unto the Father but through him, or through a belief in him, through him being Lord in your life. And believing God raised him from the dead. There's the victory over death, is believing that death has been conquered in our Lord Jesus Christ because God got him up, raised him up from the dead. And so Jesus was sent to teach us this. And we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 11. Verse 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the foundation of our lives. That's because God made him that as the sinless man and acting as the mediator, being the mediator between God and men. So when we see Jesus' life and what it was and what it is now, we see it has always been done entirely in the context of a man. 